our recording is going. So welcome to um, part three of our webinar series, Maximizing Configuration Management for the Modern World. Um, I hope you guys, I recognize some of the names, so I know some of you have been here with us in some of the other sessions. Hopefully you found them as enjoying enjoyable as in, and informative as I have. Um, it's been a pleasure being here with you guys, and, and we're wrapping up the series with part three, Best Practices for Enterprise Software Deployment. Um, my name is Wally Mead. I'm a principal program manager with Cyrusen. I've been with Cyrusen about three and a half years after spending 22 years at Microsoft, primarily in the configuration manager product group. And um, y'all, I'm sure, are well familiar with Mr. Kent. Um, he's going to go ahead and introduce himself and world famous in the configuration manager space as well. Kent. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Wally. Yeah, so um, my name is uh, Ken Dagelund, and I'm a principal consultant here at CT Global, also known as uh, as Cortec. And you know, just like you, Wally, it's a, it's 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 a pleasure here being um, not only with you but also with all the attendees. Um, yeah, so that yeah, was a very, quick introduction. There. Yep, very good. All right, so a couple of housekeeping things which you guys have heard me say before. Um, you guys are in listen-only mode, so as you have questions throughout the presentation, please do create those, but you're going to have to type them into the questions panel and you'll go to webinar interface. So type them up and um, enter them as you have them. So don't wait to the end, which is where we'll probably take the questions because um, you may forget them by then, but type them up appropriately and then just put a little context around it um, as to what the question is. So we'll know what you're asking about when we get to the Q&A at the end of the session. So, but please do like do that. We we enjoy trying to help out and answer questions as, as appropriate. Uh, um, and as you heard me say, this session is being recorded, so it'll be up on the Vimeo site um, probably tomorrow. Um, I'll, as soon as we're done here, I'll get it recorded or converted and then hand it off to Mel, who will get it uploaded to Vimeo. So go to vimeo.com slash Team Cyrusen, all one word, and you'll be able to find all three parts of this webinar series that I've done with Kent. So. Um, and you can pass it off to other colleagues that weren't able to make it, or if you want to see the demos again, or um, what did he say? Um, you can always go back and, and listen to that. So, all righty, with that, we're going to kick it off to Kent so he can go ahead and talk about uh, his best practices for software deployment in the enterprise. Let me change the presenter view here. I'll just give, <clears throat> I'll just give you like, two seconds here so the screen can load. Yep, I Let got me it. know, Wally, you yeah. got it? Yeah, I got it, Kent. And we are, and we are as far away from each other as you <laughs> possibly just, can be. Just about, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so um, so welcome to this, you know, short, short session here I have about software distribution best practices. I've tried to, to turn it around because normally when you see a title like this, you go like, ah, oh, I, you know, now we're talking about, you know, packages and how we do packages. But the truth is we have been doing packages, you know, the same way for uh, for many, many, many years in, in Configuration Manager. And that's because, you know, <laughs> the world of packages really, you know, hasn't changed that much. Um, but, but things are happening now. Um, and uh, I just want to, oh, that's me. That's Copenhagen. If you are in Copenhagen, please stop by. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, um, no, what, what I wanted to say is, you know, now nowadays, if if you think a little out of the box, then um, then a package. What is a package? Well, it's all about figuring out, you know, what is the right tool for you to use when we are deploying an application here. Uh, and an application, if it is an application, well, we have, you know, the traditional app model. We have packages. It could be that you, you know, once in a while you want to use task sequences, but it could also be all depending on what you're deploying that, you know, you might want to use a configuration item instead, or maybe you want to use the new script feature. Uh, the new script feature was one of the features we, uh, I think we demonstrated in the first series of these, uh, uh, of these uh, webcasts here. Could also be drivers. I, I hear that a lot these days, you know, how do we go about updating drivers? And um, we, we really haven't talked too much about updating drivers in the past. It was only, you know, we're doing a, we're doing a bare metal deployment or a refresh, and we of course want to get the right drivers out there. Um, but nowadays when we are doing uh, our Windows 10 servicing, 
uh, I hear some some customers are saying, hey, at the same time, while we have the machine, we also want to update the drivers. Um, and then when we're talking applications, we need to talk, you know, the the entire uh, life cycle of applications. So one thing is, you know, deploying the app. Another thing is also, can we actually uninstall the application? And what what if we have to update the application? And when we do update the application, then why are we updating the app? Uh, sometimes, um, if I'm the application owner, I will come to uh, to you as the SCCM administrator and say, you know what, here for this Adobe, whatever application it is, there is a new feature, and I, you know, I really want that. And then you will go ahead and create the update. Um, but m often there are actually updates to those applications that you are not aware of. Uh, for, for for Java, of course, we are aware of updates because, uh, you know, <laughs> we have been updating Java for so many years. The same applies to uh, Adobe Flash and Adobe Reader. But there are a lot of other applications out there that we have no idea, you know, when the updates are available and whether or not we should actually be deploying those uh, updates. So the tool build is, you know, figuring out the right feature in Configuration Manager for the right job. Uh, that's really what I'm, I want to want to discuss in here. And then, <clears throat> when we when we talk configuration manager, one of the great things about config manager is that we have you know we have so many uh, community tools. And when I talk when I talk SCCM and applications, uh, one of the more important things uh, to me is the uh, PowerShell application. Uh, deployment toolkit. The PowerShell application deployment toolkit is a free community tool. It's well documented and it will provide you with, I would say, with some of the gaps that we, we do not have in, uh, in SCCM. So you can see here we can go in and create a custom restart prompt. We can create our own way of branding. We can configure balloon tips and so on and so forth. Um, that's that's one of the reasons why I really like this. Another another reason why I really love this tool here is that it allows me uh, to go in and 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 have my all of my different packages and applications, you know, streamline all of them. So. Sometimes, you know, when you have an executable, you do that in one way. When you have an MSI file, you do that in another way. And then you have a script that's in the third way. But here with the PowerShell Application Deployment Toolkit, I actually have a toolkit here where I can streamline the entire process, you know, giving the end users the exact same uh, user experience every single time. So this is a, uh, in, in my tool belt here, when we are talking applications, this would definitely be one of the tools that I'm uh, that that I would um, that I would be using. And as I said, it, it is a free tool. Uh, another tool that I would be using when we talk applications and and um, you know figuring out if an application is out there could be the client center tool. It could of of course also I'm pretty sure while you're going to cover that after it would also be uh, the Cyrison tool because with the Cyrison tool I can go in and 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 uh, automate the way that we create applications and and automate the way we create packages all of that. I also have a driver automation tool. Uh so the driver automation tool here that's another freeware tool, another community tool here. This tool here will just, you know, help me uh, automate the entire process of uh, of downloading my uh, my drivers into a configuration manager. And and when we talk drivers or when we talk applications, you know, having having the exact exact same way of uh, of, of delivering uh, is critical. Uh, you know, I, I can walk into so many different customers, and then I can see five different ways of creating an application. You know, you know all the way down to the most basic stuff that we're using. Uh, using, uh, we're not using the same naming standard. We're not using the same uh, source location, and so on and so forth. That's that's one of the reasons why tools like this uh, is uh, is super important. So let me just go back here. <clears throat> So that I'll get into, you know, when I'll be using a configuration item and when I'll be using a script. Uh, so I'll, I'll get back to that in a few seconds here. So how do I figure out 
uh, you know, what is the right tool for me? Well, first of all, I need to know, you know, I need to know what I'm doing. What is it that I'm deploying? Uh, is it a script that I'm deploying? Is it what I, you know, would categorize as a real application? Do 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 what I'm deploying? Does that that have any dependencies? It could be dependencies to a uh, another application. It could be dependencies to hardware, but it could also be user dependencies. Um, so that that will guide me in the right direction. What is the environment? So our users, uh, uh, my clients online. Last time we uh, we talked a little about you know supporting internet-based users, and and if if you cannot connect to your internet-based users, then there are a couple of, of the tools in the build that you don't want to use. Then you don't want to use the script because the, the script doesn't live forever. Uh, the script will be using the fast channel and then it will execute on the machines that are actually online. So if, if clients are not online and if it's something, you know, okay, we are not in a hurry, but we really want everybody to create this desktop uh, shortcut, then a package might be the right uh, solution or a configuration item might be the right solution. Um, another thing that is important here would be the frequency. How often do I, knew, uh, do I have to do that? Is it just a one-timer? Is it something you know we, we're doing quite often? Uh, or am I already too late in the game? I mean, and the one with, you know, we're already too late in the game, uh, might actually uh, <clears throat> uh, might actually mean that I have to do you know more than just one tool. Maybe I have to cre create the script, use the script feature first in the fa fast channel to put out a fire, and then after that you know create a baseline and all of that good stuff. Um, <clears throat> so these I would say environment, what I'm deploying, and the frequency would would definitely guide me in the right direction. Um, and then also, um, I, I forgot one thing here, as I, as I see it. Also, you know, my content. Do I have any content? Often, uh, if it's just a, you know, if it's just a script or a file you want to copy, well, you do have a file, but that file, you know, maybe it's just uh, 23K in size. So do you, do you really want to deploy that file to 85 distribution points? Because when we are de de deploying the file or distributing the file, well, that file, that package will have to, you know, get 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 in, in, in line here. And it could easily take a week for that file to get to, you know, to all of your distribution points. And I know distributing 23K is not a big issue, but you might have an image that you're deploying at the exact same time. And if you're deploying five, six, seven gigabytes to remote locations with very poor uh, bandwidth, well, there you go. That that's kind of blocking for uh, for, for your script file here. So <clears throat> um, another thing uh, that is, I would say it's it's definitely not uh, technical, but but that is, uh, you know, where do you have to source files? And if, if you are an enterprise organization, uh, do you have a real Q and A? You know, can uh, or do you have a real QA environment? Do you have you know a test uh, test environment? Who can move and approve files that have been de deployed in tests first? So who can move them to the QA environment? Who can move them from QA over to production? That entire process, that's not something that the configuration manager delivers, but by using uh, role-based administration and some custom code, uh, we can actually uh, we can actually get get you know uh, almost there, I would say. But it requires some custom code. Um, <clears throat> finally, uh, another thing that is is kind of important is how does the application behave? You know, um, is this an application uh, that that requires some things to be installed in the, in the user context as long as something being installed as a local system. Uh, is this an application that requires uh, access to the internet? I've just been on a three-day assignment at a customer where at any given time uh, when they start a machine there can only be one user accessing the internet. So it can either be the locked-on user or it can be the local system account. So when, 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 when you have that, you really need to figure out, you know, what you're doing. In, uh, in Configuration Manager for, for a couple of years, we have been able to evaluate, uh, um, uh, elevate the end user rights. So you can still run, you know, a package in, in, in the user's um, context and then just uh, 
elevate those rights uh, to become uh, administrators because you don't want to have any local administrators here. Sometimes, as I mentioned, sometimes, you know, you're already too late in the game. Um, really depending on what it is that you are deploying. So if, let's just say that I'm, I'm trying to keep, you know, my uh, my applications up to date with uh, with with all all of the vulnerability updates we have out there. Then I need to define. I need to understand what the risk window is all about. And the risk window might be a new term that you haven't heard before, but that's the the time between this closure of a vulnerability and the time to identifying and fixing that vulnerability in your environment. Um, and and you will probably be a bit surprised here when I tell you that the risk window is typically 156 days. What does that mean? Well, it means, let me just go see here. Let's go into Microsoft Paint here. <clears throat> Second example that we that we all know about, you know, just just uh, uh, an Adobe patch or you know a Java patch or the the latest issue we had with Equifax. Um, if this is if this is you know day zero, then the risk window here was it's not a number I came up with. The risk window is 156 days. What does that mean? Well, it means that in average, it takes a company 186 days to actually go in and patch an application. So to, you know, to close that vulnerability. So the risk window is the number of days where, where the hackers are in paradise. Something like that. So this is, this is, you know, where everybody knows about this vulnerability and we have, you know, all the time in the world to go ahead and, and, and uh, get into your organization. Now, the same studies from where I got those numbers here, and I have a link in this slide deck, the same studies also tells me that I have 30 days uh, um, <clears throat> before the hackers actually become aware of this. So I have 30 days to, to go and update uh, my, my apps in here. And uh, it doesn't take 30 days to update an app. I know that. But if you do not know that there is that there is a vulnerability, when do you figure out that there is a vulnerability in that specific app? Um, I can tell you what some organizations are doing. They, you know, they have like here, my boss is watching the news and here's about a breach, you know the uh, Equifax, uh, again, the Equifax breach. But by the time, you know, uh, a vulnerability hits the news and it's a breach, it's already too late. I don't have, I don't have the number, you know, <laughs> a number of days from, you know, from 30 days until it, uh, you know, your boss knows about it. But I do know it's way after, typically it would be way after 30 days. So that's, that's kind of important and also, as we are planning, uh, as we are planning, you know, software distribution in here, it's important to to understand, you know, uh, <clears throat> what is the risk window, and how, what, what should we be doing here uh, to make sure that we don't we don't become like all the other organizations where the average time uh, from you know we had, as someone identifies it to remediation is. 186 days, and I, as, as I mentioned, I just came back from a three-day assignment, a security assignment at a customer, and I saw a lot of applications there where um, a, a vulnerability uh, has had been known for more than 400 days, and that that's not an you know that's a very average customer. Uh, the thing is, we typically do not know what we have out there, uh, and it doesn't really matter if you're just 500 in your organization, or if you're 56,000 in your organization, there is there is no way that a single person can know you know everything you have installed out there. So so the uh, the, the the risk window here is super 
important, you know, because this is, as I, as I mentioned, these are the number of days where I, as a hacker, I'm not a hacker, but if I were, you know, I, I would have plenty of time here to uh, to play around. So, <clears throat> um, so let me just go into my environment. Um, <clears throat> And let's get on to this one here. So understanding, if, if we talk about the risk window first, then uh, as I mentioned, there is no way that, that you or I as, a, um, as, as, as an admin can figure out how many insecure applications do we have out there, how should we prioritize this and so on and so forth. Because there, there are so many different um, uh, so many uh, different uh, applications and vulnerabilities in our environment. So one of the things that we have, and we would be uh, CT Global, we have uh, a, a service we call Inside Analytics. And with Inside Analytics, I can go in and visualize my environment. So here I have visualized part of my software distribution environment. So for instance, how many insecure applications do I have? Here I'm looking at a specific set of applications. I'm not looking at all my apps. I'm also looking at my patch infrastructure because as we are di distributing updates, we might be using uh, the Windows Update Agent. And if I have some you know, non-compliant, maybe the Windows Update Agent is not working, maybe it's an older version, or maybe it's, you know, misconfigured and so on and so forth, then I'll never be able to uh, deploy my patches. So having information about that is super important. Now, <clears throat> I know that when 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 I show this, my manager will she will go like, okay, that's fine, Kent. I I really do not care about the greens. I want to understand why we have 8.5 percent here that are non-compliant. Um, so what I do is when I click on the on on the uh, widget here, it will take me. So this is a uh, an Azure service we have. This will take me on premise. Oh Jesus, I don't have. I logged in with the wrong credentials. Um, Never mind. Let's see if I still have it here. Still have it here. But it will take me. Uh, it will take me to my uh, my Azure services here, and it will just show me a report. I just have to log in with the right credentials to do that. And it will show me a report and it will show me a list of uh, the machines there that are uh, non-compliant. So that's that's one thing. Another thing we wanna we we wanna have insights into is of course you know just the, the the normal deployments that we have so a normal deployment would be you know like an application it could be you know a support tool that i mentioned maybe maybe it's just a script maybe it's a maybe it's a task sequence that you want to deploy and <clears throat> in order for me to deploy part of this if i go into configuration manager i i kind of take a little for granted that that those of you here attending, you have seen how we create an application. Um, so if I go into, <clears throat> if I go in and show you an alternative way, then uh, one thing we had to do yesterday was actually copying a file. So we have in, in Configuration Manager, we have a file called the CCM evaluation file. The CCM evaluation XML file is a uh, um, native part of, of SCCM and this file here uh, will will instruct the SCCM client to go in and do, and, and do a lot of checks to figure out if the client is healthy or not. Uh, this file here is found on, on um, if I, let me just go in here to my Windows folder. Oh. I have it right here. <clears throat> so instead of me just talking about a, uh, a file that I copy, I want to give you the background here. So when I'm looking at the uh, CCM report XML file, user account control, um, and I'm using looking at the CCM XML file. Let me just get these here out to the desktop because it's just user account control preventing me from opening the files. Uh, <clears throat> the CCM evaluation file here, this is a file that we have on every single SCCM client. Now, this file 
is you can see here, it, it instructs the CCM evaluation process to go in and perform a lot of checks. And this happens every 24 hours, you know. Is WMI working, you know, a lot of different WMI checks. Is, is the client, you know, on the right version and so on and so forth. You can add in your own checks to this file here. And that's what we have done. So we, we know that uh, from time to time, it's a great idea to restart the service. So we have added some logic to restart the service uh, at the end of this file. <clears throat> so we need to copy this file here. Um, but the thing is, um, if we upgrade in a client, then maybe the CCM upgrade process will just restore the original file and we have a custom file. So, so this is what I mean by you know the lifespan I need to figure out what it is that I'm trying to do so in here and when I look at the this specific CI it's a CI because I want to perform a check uh, on a daily basis when I'm looking at my settings here you'll see this setting type here is what we call a, a file system <clears throat> so it's it's basically here it's looking to see whether or not I have the right version of that specific file. So this file we are looking for has to be this exact size because that's the exact size that we have. Okay, so that's part of it. So now I'm checking to figure out whether or not a client actually has my file. The other part could be a traditional package. <clears throat> so when I go in here, I have my CCM evaluation package and this CCM evaluation package, this is then a package, if I go in, let me just look at my data source here. Looking at that, you'll see here, this is my XML file and then I just have a simple script that will go in and copy that XML file. But copying the XML file here, uh, and this is you know, just a super simple script here, copying the XML file, I don't know if I need to do that. So we are deploying the baseline that will perform the check. When you're deploying the baseline, uh, each of the baselines that you do have, if I go back in here to my configuration items, each of my uh, each of my deployments here doesn't really matter what deployment I select here, but if I select the Windows 10 Diagnostics, then each of the deployments here that I have, I can just right click and then I can create a new collection based on whether or not the result is compliant or non-compliant. So here with my CCM ev evaluation, instead of just you know creating a package and then hope that it will stay down there, then I'm also combining this with a CI to figure out whether or not I have to reinstall this package here. I could also in the CI, I could in, in the CI itself, I could have placed in the file copy. Uh, but now we just selected to use a to use a package here. Um, so there is, I mean, there is a um, there is a lot of different things that you can do. Uh, I for those of you who didn't attend the first session here, um, let me just quickly show you uh, the script in here because the script is a little different. Remember, a script is something we we uh, we execute more or less in real time. Uh, I have a I have a couple of uh, well, I misspelled history here. I have a couple of examples that I have used in my own environment. First of all, I had to delete the WMI namespace. I had I had to do that, you know, like right now. So I'm running this. I'm creating a script. When I'm creating the script here, it can just be no, you know, be any PowerShell script. Once I have done that. Then I need to uh, I need to get my uh, my administrator to approve that. I just happen to be also administrator in here, so I went in and I approved my own script, which is probably not a good idea, but it is what it is. Um, and then <clears throat> after that, I can go in and I can select a collection and execute the script on that specific collection. So if I run the script here. Then it's just going to ask me, so what script is it you want to execute? And then I click next and it will execute right now. Uh, but this will only work for the machines that are online, right? So all the other machines, they won't get it. So that's the reason why a script, um, as, as, as a, one of your tools in the tool belt, you know, only works for, for a certain number of machines in here. Uh, <clears throat> 
one more thing, and then I'll hand it over to Wally. Uh, I, I I did mention I did mention that you know the risk window and and all of that stuff, and I also mentioned that we <clears throat> in our inside analytics here. Uh, you'll see if I go into my patch management view that I've created. So I use this tool here to visualize anything and any object I have within uh, SCCM. And we also integrate with with partners. So here I have an integration, as I mentioned, with with Flexera. So I can see here, okay, so so how vulnerable am I actually uh, with with the uh, patches that we have released in September for third-party updates? It's not all patches I release, and I, I wouldn't be able to figure out the risk window here for me without having having like a a, a third-party add-on. So this third-party add-on here, just quickly, uh, will give me insights to you know what are the advisories, the most critical advisories and last latest advisories impacting my environment. And that's that's kind of important. It's super important when you're talking software distribution. Otherwise, you have no idea where you should prioritize your time. So with with the right insight, uh, you can you can quickly see you know how you're doing on all your deployments. You can also see if you have to go in and create a deployment. And a deployment could be you know I want to disable a protocol. Uh, and if you cannot disable SMB1, well, guess what? You should never be creating or you should never be de deploying the uh, the next version of Windows 10 because in the next version of Windows 10, you don't have SMB1. So you might as well, you know, check this out uh, right away. Uh, so a lot of a lot of best practices when we are talking um, software distribution. Uh, and traditionally, we talk packages and applications, but that could be, you know, I just showed you configuration items, uh, scripts, uh, talked a little about updates, how we're handling that. Um, with that, Wally, I took two minutes of your time. I hope that's okay. I think we'll be quite fine, Kent. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, and, and we all learned that Kent is an aspiring hacker. So he likes that um, 186 days um, um, or 156 after he finds out about it. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so there, is, there, is, there is absolutely no stress when we have 156 days. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So so thanks for that, Kent. So I, hopefully you guys all saw some great um, um different insights into different ways of doing software distribution. And that's one of the things that, like Kent mentioned, um, um, packages and programs, they've been around since SMS 1.0, so 20 some years now. Um, applications, yeah, it's a little bit newer in, in Configman 2012 and people are migrating over to those, but people don't think about them configuration items um, as ways of getting software deployed out there, whether it's just doing the um, evaluation like Kent was showing and then doing remediation through a normal package, or you could even, um, I'm actually surprised you didn't show a, a script there as your, um, I mean, your configuration item to go ahead and deploy your software, because I, I know you like to do that a lot too. So. But now that new scripts feature, that runs scripts feature in the in the console, it's a, as of 1706, is a fantastic feature. So let me go ahead, and I guess I better change the presenter back over to me so I can show my slides. That's going to make things a little bit easier, I guess, as I'm talking. But yeah, so a lot of cool things there to think about. So um, again, thanks for that, Kent. Um, and hopefully you guys did um, find that valuable and, and beneficial for you. So. So what I want to talk about here is, um, so Ket talked a little bit about packages, programs, applications, and then went into some of the other things. Um, I want to talk about how you can help, and he mentioned um, our tool for helping automate and make it easier for you to create some of those software distribution objects. And that's what I want to talk about, how you can use the Cyrus and Portal for Configuration Manager to extend your reach of Configuration Manager throughout your IT organization easily and securely and giving people the the features that they need to have access to. So just a real couple little, um, um, I know Kent took out his obligatory marketing slides in this one, but um, I go through them real quickly. Started as a software and services company about six years ago doing services for System Center, primarily service manager, found usability gaps. We started creating some applications for those, found out those are really popular. Um, so we created a service management stream to help you as an admin in service manager with some 
tools and um, features to help fill in some of those gaps. And also on the end user side with the self-service portal, got into asset management, which helps take your configuration manager data from config manager, which is a ton of it there, but it's hard to do a lot with it. And then put it into service manager into CMDB so you can modify that with your, enhance it with your life cycle information that you need, contracts, warranties, um, your financial information, you're tying your software to your hardware assets and so on, and then configuration manager. So we have some free tools. One of those um, um, Kent kind of alluded to is like the remote manage tool be somewhat similar to the client center utility or those right click tools to help with kicking off some client actions and connecting up to clients. But the one I'm going to talk about here is the Cyrus and portal for configuration manager. So just a couple of stats on us as a company over 1,200 customers in, I think it's 65 countries worldwide now, uh, and 99% of our customers renew with us um, once they find the value and benefit of it, and those that don't are primarily ones that um, have decided to move off of service manager as a platform, as Microsoft hasn't really been very committed to it um, recently. And just some of our customers that we have throughout uh, the various different inter industries, whether it's automotive or whether it's government or um, education, energy, whatever. And then almost all of our products sit on top of System Center. Uh, we have one, we have a password reset technology, which doesn't require any System Center. So if you want to self-service some um, password reset without your end users talking to um, your help desk team, uh, we have that. But the rest of them all sit on top of System Center, which is configuration manager in, in my case. So. So let's talk about how you can make it easier for your teams to both create and deploy software. One of the big things that I got asked for a ton of times when I was in the product group was we want a web-based console. And you, Kent showed you the configuration manager console, which you guys are well familiar with. Um, and people have always wanted a web-based console and the product group's response was, uh, yeah, we'll get around to it maybe, but right now we'll leave it to third parties. Well, not much for third parties have done that, so we've decided to do that. So we've got a it, what we think is a very intuitive, easy to use web interface. So you're not tied to an installation of the configuration manager console that you have to keep up to date. Um, you just have to go to your web browser and connect up to the um, the website. But very, very easy to use, especially for those scenarios where you have help desk people that might turn over fairly frequently, move on to um, different jobs within the organization. So what we're doing in this web, pay, web based interface is exposing the data from configuration manager that we think that your service desk, your desktop support team, your IT managers need to have in order to do their jobs simply and easily with the configuration manager portal. So we want to make that available in a secure fashion so you get to control which users of the Cyrus and portal for configuration manager have access to which features, which means which data they have. When we're not only exposing that data, we want to allow you to create and interact with that data. So we want to allow you to create software in the case of what we're talking about here, or provision new computers, or create task sequences. We want you to be able to deploy software. So we just don't want to give you the core features that Configuration Manager has in a web interface. We also want to enhance those capabilities. So one of the cool things you'll see today, besides the fact it's a web interface and hopefully easier to walk through those wizards then you can think about in the configuration manager console but also we create these things we call templates so templates are pre-created settings for software creation or software deployment so if you think about the process of creating a package or creating an application or deploying a um, task sequence or whatever it is there's a lot of those different wizard pages you have to walk through, a lot of different settings, a lot of different controls, radio buttons and sliders and whatever that you have to go and set that if you forget to set one of those, your software may not work the way you want it to work. So we create these templates that you can very easily apply during the software creation or software deployment process. And you'll see those throughout the demo coming up here momentarily. Uh, in last week's session, I showed you our commence solution. So if you are using Configuration Manager and deploying bare metal clients or even doing operating system uh, refreshes um, or reinstalls, um, and you're doing Pixie or even just on a single computer uh, existing client, you don't want to use Software Center, uh, commence is a um, intuitive interface to allow you to 
have some interaction with that operating system deployment process. And I walked you through what Commence looked at like last week. And it also has configurable security. So you get to control who has access to what features, what templates for uh, the process. And as Kent very well um, told you guys numerous times in his, in his portion was reporting. Reporting is absolutely key in keeping your environment up to date and making sure management is aware of the progress you've been making and how stable, how secure, how efficient, how up to date your environment is. So you got to be able to have some dashboards and reports there to show management and as well as your the rest of your IT team to make sure things are going well. So what we do is we give you a core dashboard that you'll see here in just a second um, of some high level information. And then we, for reporting purposes, when you want to get into reporting, you guys all know there's close to 500 reports, 470 some reports in, in the later releases of Configuration Manager. And nobody wants to weed through all those to find those half dozen or dozen different reports that you really utilize. So we let you pick and choose, cherry pick as it's called, those individual reports that are beneficial to your organization, link them into the CMP, and then use that configurable role-based administration security to control which reports your users of the CMP will see when they go ahead and access it. So as far as your IT team and who can utilize the Cyrus and Portal for Configuration Manager effectively, uh, we really target the middle three personas in this slide. So your service desk or help desk analyst who needs to query a user to find their computer, look at the inventory of that computer, look at its status, see if software is installed, maybe even deploy some software out to that computer. Your desktop server support team would do all the stuff that your service desk analyst would do, but on a level two type basis when the service desk analyst can't resolve that issue. Plus, it's probably going to do the OS deployments. So um, maybe creating the task sequences and deploying them. Um, maybe one of, they're going to be the packagers that are going to create your applications and your packages inside Configuration Manager. Management, they're, good, they're not want to have access to the configuration manager console they just want to see the end results so whether it's the insights analytics that um, kent was showing you with his um, um dashboards or uh, just the configuration manager reports that's all they want they don't want the rest of the the clutter in the configuration manager console so it's very easy to create a um, login persona in the Cyrus and Portal for Configuration Manager that would just have the dashboard and maybe just have the reports and maybe, maybe only three or four reports that management would need to have access to. Now, your end users are happier because of the fact that their issue is getting resolved faster because it's easier for your help desk team to resolve the, the issues by um, the more intuitive web interface and having to dive through the resource explorer data in Configuration Manager. And your Config Man admins, you certainly will live and stay inside your config man console. You'll use some of those tools that Kent was talking about to help enhance your experience. Uh, this is another tool in that tool belt to help you uh, expose the features of configuration manager, other people in your teams, but also for yourself, you're in a meeting, you don't have your laptop with you and somebody asks you something, well, you can just go to the, the local conference rooms PC, log into the website and find that information. So let's go ahead and take you through this um, for the few minutes that we have left and let you see how you can do your software distribution stuff in, within the Cyrus and Portal for Configuration Manager. And here, just I'll just set the context for you. I'm logged in as the global administrator here. Uh, so I've got access to all the features, all the capabilities, and all the data. And this is our dashboard. So our dashboard just from the top is going to show you the total number of computers you have in your environment, total number of users, what your client health rate is, and what your client activity rate is. Um, so client health is not too bad. Client activity is low, but I've only booted up a, a few of my images right now, so I don't have all my images running. Um, and then we show you cl um, clients by CMP status. You can see that all the clients are active. It's a different activity um, tracker that we have than Configuration Manager does, which is what these top numbers are. Um, clients by operating systems. So just hover over and we'll tell you what number of clients you have in those different operating systems. Lower left is very cool related to software distribution is my deployment status. So if you think about the monitoring workspace, so if I go over to Configuration Manager Console and I go to Monitoring Workspace, I go to the Deployments node, I get this list of all my deployments, the collection, the purpose, the action, the type, and then my compliance rate. And I have to pick an individual deployment 
and then I have to click on the view status to get down to the details of it. Well, here with the Cyrus and Portal for Configuration Manager, we're giving you a, an overall snapshot. So I see if all my deployments, I have currently five of them with unknown as the worst status. I have one that's an error, so that's where I want to concentrate on right now. And I have one success. So very, very easy to get a high level snapshot of that. And I'll drill into that in just a second, a little bit further. And then lower right is my computers with missing updates by severity. So you see the different um, number of updates um, in, in the different severity categories. Now, related, I've got the navigation bar here on the left-hand side to allow me to look at computers, look at my software, for example, what we're going to concentrate on here. So I click this, it's going to show me all the software that is coming from Configuration Manager. I have different views, so here's my standard software view, so I'm seeing all the software they have in my environment. But maybe for Kent, maybe I only want him to have access to Microsoft software. So I'll give him a view of just Microsoft. So he'll see all the software that has Microsoft as a uh, manufacturer. And maybe for John, I only want him to look at the Cyrus and software. So I can create a view of that way. I can have software based with views based for server software versus desktop software. Maybe I want to have um, only web software. Maybe I want to have software for different countries. I know in Europe, you guys have a lot of um, legalities around uh, regulatory compliance and exporting software. So maybe you have it by countries and so on. And I'll show you, um, get into that here a little bit more. I go back to the standard view um, so I can see all my software. Um, so we show you the manufacturer. And these are customizable as far as what columns you display. I just have it showing the manufacturer, the name, uh, the version, the language, which everything for me is English. I haven't designated it applications, packages, and then DP status. So my DP status is showing me how many distribution points this software is targeted to, and then how many is compliant on. Um, in this case, two out of two, zero out of zero, one out of one. If I pick a piece of software, then down at the bottom, I get some um, stuff, additional information that in the details pane. Overview, I can see what distribution points my software is targeted to. I can see if I have any, if this software is any MDT roles, um, what computers are targeted with this software, what deployment types, if this is an application, it'll show me what my deployment types are, and then what physical deployments I have, as well as what the current status is of that deployment. So I can see this deployment is unknown, here's who it's targeted to, and I have one resource as unknown status on it. All right, and I'll show you creation here in just a moment, but I just want to set a little bit of context. And the last thing I'll show you before I switch over to uh, my my um, app packager persona is just our deployments. So if you remember on the dashboard in the lower left, left, left hand corner, we had the deployment status and had five unknown, one error, one um, success. So by default, when you go to deployments dashboard, it says for just the last two days, so let me go ahead and filter down to all my deployments. So this would be very much like the deployments node in the monitoring workspace in the console, except we're showing you all the deployments of software. We're giving you a color-coded indicator as to its current status. And then the drill in information is right here. So you don't have to click on a piece of software, then click the view status to see the numbers of all those different um, um, resources um, that are targeted. So it, what you want to do, obviously, you want to focus on the one that's in the error state, because that's the red or pink um, with your error. So I want to click on that one. It'll drill directly into that software. So very easily, oops, this is an <laughs> issue we have in uh, this software that's already been fixed. Sorry about that. Um, um, for it's a, he had an issue with the packages. Let me go to here to uh, this guy's success. And you should see proper, there you go. You see success. Um, your data, it's all the computers with the uh, status of uh, success for that software. Okay, so that's kind of the monitoring and the admin portion of it. So what I've done here to set the, set the context, now I'm gonna to go to security settings, and I'm gonna show you that for my application packager, I went to security rights. I've got a global group called app packagers. And in the browse menu, which is my navigation pane off to the left-hand side, I've given him only access to software. So that's the only one of these nodes here on the left-hand side he's gonna see. And then for new, I gave him access to new software, being able to create a new application, create a new package. So I'm gonna go ahead and load Google Chrome, just so you can see it's in a different browser. And I'm gonna to go to our website. I'm gonna log in as user four, which is my app packager. 
with my password. And provided I supplied everything, oops, I guess I did not. Uh, user four. There we go. I apparently I did not supply the correct password. So, um, so you can see that in the navigation pane, he only has access to software. No dashboard, no computers, no users, no task sequences, no reports, etc. And here's I gave him access to the standard software view, so he's got access to all the different software. And down in the new menu where I create new objects, I have the ability to create new software, so I can create new applications and new packages. So let's walk through one of these really quickly, and we'll show you the power and the benefit of those um, templates. So let me go ahead and create a traditional package that you guys are all familiar with. So again, think about the package creation process and configuration manager. And this is what we'll walk through here. So first thing I have is target software sources. So these are these source locations where I want to have kind of like the intermediary storage location between the real source files and what I get put out on the distribution point because we're building some stuff up here. So I can create different sources where if my guy is knowing he's creating a piece of software for servers, I'm going to keep all my server software stored in one spot. I can have that as my source. And I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and um, do a workstation software here. I browse to my source file. And my source file in this case, I'll go down to a, uh, a share here. And I'm going to take uh, maybe DCM tool. So I'll take this MSI file and I'll load this in. So it tells me it's Microsoft, the name of the information that it reads from the MSI file. Now I want to select a template because if you look at the package, there's nothing configured here as far as distribution points, no settings here that are configured on data access or distribution settings. Um, so what I want to do and is go to here, I want to go ahead and load a template. So I'm going to go ahead and load a workstation packages template. So I'll click load. And now as I go to the next wizard page, packages, you'll see that it, that template automatically selected the persist content and client cache. It automatically selected the client DP's distribution point group. And it has my client DP's DP group selected for me. Um, I don't remember if I had anything. I didn't have anything set here. And I don't think I had anything set there either um, on those other tabs. But I could certainly have other things set in that template. But there's a couple of settings that were set automatically for me. So I make sure I get the right distribution points set for this workstation software and don't have to remember that. And I get that persist content and client cache. Now for programs, all I have to do is uh, by default, we assume you want an install and an uninstall program. So all I have to do is load the command line. So I'll just click browse. I'll take, in this case, it's MSI. It's very easy. I just take that MSI file, load it in and and it, uh, it, did I not click it correctly? Uh, click the MSI and click OK. And there we go. And there's the MSI exec command got brought in. So it has the MSI exec command for me automatically. And um, I may have some requirements. So notice any platform is not set automatically, but I changed that to have only my, I think Windows 10. Oh, there's, so there's Windows 10. Windows 8.1, probably had Windows 7 set earlier. So I've got the platform set correctly. I've got the environment set run with whether or not a user's logged on. I can have all these tabs set with them, other values as well. Now I want to have an uninstall program. I can either remove it or if I want to keep it, I'll go ahead and switch to it and I'll browse in that same command line, that same file. And here now there's a slash X on MSI exec. I could also go add in my own. So maybe I want to have a a custom installer that ha is user driven as opposed to unattended slash Q slash I. Um, so that will load all those appropriate values for me. Now, if I were to go back here to the general tab and switch my template over to server packages, I'm assuming I have some different settings here. Uh, so the persist content and client cache is not there and different data center, different DP group. So now it's data center DPs as opposed to um, the client DPs. So again, they'll just set the appropriate values for me for my um, software. So I got the uninstall command line. It's got a command line. Um, it'll let me know if I don't have command line set. And I just go ahead and click finish. And this is telling configuration manager now through the SMS provider to go create that application um, through configuration manager. So that will appear here momentarily. It gets created through the provider and then it'll get, there it is. It's created back in here. And you can see it's targeted on a distribution point. Right now, it's not there yet. If I go ahead and refresh, it's probably distributed by now. 
uh, not quite yet, but um, in Config Manager, if I go look at the software, we'll see that it is in the process of being distributed. So that was a package. I have it storing in a custom folder. Here's my DC authoring tools. And in fact, it already says it's done distributing out to that distribution point. Now, I'll just show you again, it's the app packager. I'll go ahead and create an application just to show you that as well. Um, again, just think about the wizard in Configuration Manager. And maybe this time I'll, I'll just do common software. It remembers where I was last time. And maybe I want to take Google Chrome. And we'll load that in as our software. And it's going to go ahead and read the MSI. And it's going to read some properties here. I'll load a template. I have the same type of templates available to me. So if I go ahead and load that, now you'll see they've got a distribution point selected. And in this case, it's, since I was a workstation, it's the actual member DP as opposed to if I go and click on the server template, it's going to go ahead and switch that over to my data center DP. So again, just the templates are presetting some of those values for me so that I don't have to remember that. Automatically creates the install uninstall commands. It does the detection method automatically. Uh, my template has some requirements in it. So I can put in dependencies, supersedence, distribution settings, and so on as I deem necessary for my application in this case. And I just click finish to finish off the wizard. And it again, it's going through the provider to configuration manager to create that application and getting that application dumped out to the appropriate distribution points. And if I go ahead and here, you can see that the DCM authoring tools is updated on the DP now. And what was I doing? No, Google Chrome. Um, so let me do another refresh and see if it's done with creating that. There we go, Google Chrome's been created and it's getting in the process of being distributed out to my distribution point. Now that I've done that as an app packager, I don't give the app packager rights to deploy software, but I could go ahead and go back as my full admin. That software will now be in my list of software over here as well. And as I showed you in um, our first session a few weeks ago, I could take that software and I could go ahead and take that software and right click it and do a deploy software. Uh, so let me go ahead and do a refresh to get that. Uh, so Google Chrome. And by the, uh, I didn't show you here, but I can also right click and, and do distribute content. So if my software wasn't on the proper distribution points, I can go ahead and manage that. I can add it to additional distribution points or remove it from a distribution point um, using the right click action here as well. But if I want to go ahead and deploy that, I can just go ahead and deploy software. The quick and easy way is quick de software deployment. And when I showed you this uh, before, um, I mentioned this, but I was using a help desk person who was only allowing one piece of software at a time. And here you can see that I can pick multiple pieces of software in the same deployment wizard if I want to. Um, it'll just create multiple different deployments. And I'll just pick one for now. And I want to send this out to my Windows 7 client. So I'll pick that. Or I could go ahead and go to users if I want to. But again, I'm deploying the software out to my computer. So I go back to my client 7. And then I go ahead and load a deployment template. So this is workstation software, and it sets a, as soon as possible as far as my deployment, and it has some other value set there for me automatically. So that's all the harder it is to deploy software. I pick my either my computer, my user, my software, do a right click on that and do a deploy software. Probably it's gonna do in the quick software deployment, so I don't have to think about collections. Let's just let Config Manager create that collection on the fly and let it um, handle all that work appropriately if that software collection doesn't already exist. And so now it goes ahead and um, takes me to the deployments node and I do a refresh here. And my deployment here for uh, Google Chrome, and there it is right here in the middle, um, has now been added into my list. And my dashboard then should be, um, I think I now six of them that, yeah, six deployments now with um, unknown status. Yep, very good. And that went ahead and created a collection for us in Configuration Manager. So just to show you that again, if I go back into the Config Man console, it went ahead and created a device collection that I put here for a Google Chrome install and added one resource to that collection, which was, I think it was Client 7. So if I show members, you should see client seven in there. And then there's the um, deployment would have been created um, for that um, automatically. So if that collection 
Google Chrome install exists, which it does now, if some other person in the help desk says, oh, my end user wants, Wally wants to have access to Google Chrome, it'll just add that computer directly to that collection and use that existing collection and deployment um, and ready to roll. So very, very easy to go ahead and create software, even as just a limited role for that, and then deploy software. And I did it through the full admin experience, but it very easily could have been the help desk scenario that we showed you a few weeks ago back in part one. Uh, again, you get the recording if you want to from the Vimeo site if you missed that. So, so hopefully you saw some cool things there that um, can help um, um, provide some benefit to you in the um, software distribution scenario. So with that, um, Configuration Manager, as I've said in all these webinars uh, that we've done, is fantastic. You really want to make sure you're on the current branch release and staying up to date, which is pretty easy to do with the updates and servicing feature. Um, 1706 is the current release as far as production. Um, 1709 Tech Preview just came out um, a week or so ago, and we're hoping 1710 Production Environment will be out um, very shortly as well. Um, to help you provide more use of Configuration Manager in your organization, you might want to look at some of these tools that Kent was mentioning, as well as um, our Cyrus and Portal for Configuration Manager. It makes it very, very easy for you to create and deploy software and control who has those capabilities and gives you a more consistent, repeatable process with the use of those templates to help you um, have that more error-free result because of the fact that you have these templates which are pre-creating all these values for you and this web interface to hopefully make it easier to walk through and, and utilize the features in that creation of software, that deployment of software. So if you do like what you saw there, you can go ahead and go to this uh, uh, link down at the bottom of the slide. You can download a free community version of the Cyrus and Portal for Configuration Manager. Um, you can also request a full trial key, uh, which will give you 30 days to use the full software. The community edition is a, a, a limited version. Like you can't create software. So if you want to test out software creation, you just go to that same link and just request a trial key from us. And then you punch that trial key into the community version. It converts you over to the full functioning version, no restrictions at all, other than the fact that it's only valid for 30 days. And there's also some videos up there and um, some other um, um, screenshots and so on up there to give you more information on the Cyrus and Portal for Configuration Manager. So with that, um, let's go ahead and jump it over to Q&A. Uh, right now, I'm not seeing anything in the, in the questions panel, but um, now is the time if you guys do have questions on um, anything that Kent talked about, whether it's the risk windows or any of those tools that he talked about or um, benefits of using task sequences versus configuration items versus the run scripts or packages programs um, or any questions you would have on the Cyrus and Portal for Configuration Manager. Now is a fantastic time to go ahead and type those up and get those in. While you guys are doing that, again, I'll just thank you for your time. Um, for those of you that um, stuck with us for all three of these sessions. Um, I've really enjoyed it, and I'm uh, hoping Kent has as well. Um, and it's just been a pleasure, as always, um, being involved with any presentation that Kent's involved with. So um, it's you know, he's always got some great insights into um, all the different customers he's working with and what he's encountering and what they're having to do to resolve those customer issues. So a lot of great um, information, best practices, um, state-of-the-art um, information as far as what the current environment's like. Um, so it's fantastic. And thank you very much for co-sponsoring these with us, Kent, and, and presenting. I've really enjoyed it. Um, my pleasure all, all the way, sir. Yep, it always is, it always is fantastic. <laughs> um, so it's fun time. Um, so again, hopefully you guys that have attended um, or listened to the recordings um, after the fact of, uh, have learned something to help you in your configuration manager environments, um, whether it's just what's up keeping up to date or on how you can manage um, with the Windows 10, um, with the co-management and Windows Autopilot that Kent referenced last time or um, the, some of the best practices for software distribution. Then, And again, hopefully you've seen some things in the Cyrus and Portal for Configuration Manager that um, are getting you excited and want to explore there. So, so still no questions coming in. So I'll hang out here for another moment, see if anybody does pop in any questions. Um, and then I'll go ahead and close this out. Um, we're still recording, so if any questions do come in, they will get in the, they will get into the recorded um, session that we'll get up there. And again, when we're done with the session, when it ended, I'll get it recorded over to the proper format and hand it off to um, uh, Melanie, who will get uploaded to the Vimeo site. So again, you can always go to vimeo.com/teamcyrison, 
um, all one word, and that will um, take you to the link, and you'll be able to find the links to the last two um, sessions that Kent and I did, um, as well as this one, and uh, probably tomorrow um, it'll be up. She's pretty quick about getting these, those up there. So, all right, looks like we um, gave them everything they wanted to know there, Kent. So let's go ahead and close this out, and you guys have a great rest of your day over there in Europe. Um, and I'm going to have a hopefully a great start of my day here, or continuation of my day since it's 7 a.m. here. Yeah, here it's 4, 4 o'clock. So, yeah, have a great day, Wally, and, and thanks for taking your time here. All right. Thanks again, Kent, and thanks to all of you who have attended. I appreciate it, and good luck in all you're doing. Thanks, guys. Bye.